Halloween, a time for scary movies, trick or treating, and revealing costumes that we'll pretend we don't secretly enjoy. Yes, Halloween has indeed become a mockery of itself, if you ask me. From screaming kids walking around as Iron Man or Ben 10, or, or whatever crap kids watch now, to slow Newsday writers who believe that dressing up as a witch contributes to misogyny. <sighs> the point I'm trying to make is that Halloween isn't even that scary anymore. So hopefully, with this video, I'll be able to give you some chills and serve to remind you that while Halloween is now something of a family, neighbourhoody type holiday, there have been some rather diabolical and downright weird things to happen on the 31st of October. Today, we'll be looking at some of the unsolved murders and disappearances on the spookiest night of the year. And while we're still a week away from that fateful night, maybe this video might have you think twice about taking such an evening of horrors lightly. Marvin Brandland and the Trick or Treat Shooter It was a Saturday evening when Marvin Brandland and his wife Ethel were handing out candy to trick or treaters. It was a normal Halloween at Fort Dodge, Iowa, as far as anyone was concerned. However, at some point, there came a final knocking at the door that night. Expecting it to be another kid asking for candy, the couple opened the door, only to find someone wearing a pillowcase over their head, with holes cut out around the eyes. Trick or treat, he said. Give me your money, or I'll shoot. Ethel thought it was a joke, pretty much laughed in the man's face, and playfully tried to remove the pillowcase from his head. But the man held it down tightly, refusing to allow Ethel to reveal his identity. When Ethel reached around to offer the man candy, the hooded trick-or-treater lunged in after her and pulled out a gun. He ordered both Ethel and Marvin into the basement, claiming that he wanted access to the safe and its contents. Ethel believed that the man must have been a relative or a family friend playing a prank, because only close members of the family knew about the existence of this safe. Pretty soon though, Marvin refused to abide by the intruder's orders. He made a reach for the gun, seeking to disarm the man, but the trick-or-treater shot him right in the throat. After the shot, the killer removed the pillowcase from his head and set it on the floor before walking out. Ethel was able to get a good look at the man's face, but she was unable to identify him. In the weeks after Marvin's death, a family acquaintance was said to brag about being the shooter, but no evidence has been able to convict this person. To make matters worse, there was no substantial DNA left behind on the pillowcase from the killer. To this day, over 30 years later, the trick-or-treat killer still remains at large. David Stone and the Search for the Beast David Stone was described as a successful man with a sharp, analytical mind. After all, he was a stock market analyst, and a good one too, as far as his professional reputation went. He was a mild manner type of man, one who was calm and collected. So when he got into a heated argument a few nights before Halloween in 1988, his closest friends were shocked by his violent outburst. It was so out of character that his friends didn't even know what to do. Stone decided to leave the party, informing his friends that he was going to cool off. In the next few hours, he was seen sitting next to his vehicle on Highway 80, but apparently set off on foot into the desert. He was spotted by several witnesses that same evening, including by a farmer who found him wandering about his property. The farmer noticed that he was dressed inappropriately for the cold weather that would soon sweep across the desert and asked if he was okay. In response, Stone simply said that he was searching for the beast. After this, no one would ever see him again. His car was found on November 5th, off the same highway park near some pyramid-shaped mountains, which some believe is linked to some sort of occultist symbolism that Stone may or may not have had some interest in. Searchers headed north of where his car was found, and later discovered two small pyramids, fashioned out of rocks, with Stone's Rolex beside them. Three miles further up, they found a Fibonacci sequence, 
a mathematical sequence that involves finding a number by adding up the two numbers before it. However, this sequence ended with the number 18, as opposed to the standard number of 21. The relevance of this has never been figured out, but what a strange and random thing to have written in the sand. Some say it's a sequence used in stock analysis, or that Stone may have been using it for some other purpose, but I guess we'll never know as to why this was ever written here in the sand. Hounds were able to track David's scent along Highway 80, a total of 13 miles north, but the trail went cold after that. To further add to the mystery, a note was found inside his car that read, the word is in the safe, six knives in Rob's room. Use buy your tea, use take your chances, Halloween. Two hikers would find Stone's remains in the desert in 1992, four years after his disappearance. Despite having no idea as to what caused his erratic behaviour before his death, there were no signs of foul play during his autopsy. Some believe that Stone encountered drug smugglers who murdered him, as the area in which his body was found is a choice location for smuggling. Police, however, chalked Stone's death up to dehydration and prolonged exposure to the elements. Ronald Clark O'Brien, the Candyman Killer. One aspect of Halloween I've never quite understood is going up to a stranger's house, knocking on their door and asking them for candy. It just always seemed pretty weird, and maybe I've got good reason to be suspicious considering this chilling story from 1974. Ronald O'Brien of Deer Park, Texas took his son Timothy trick-or-treating along with friend Jim Bates and his children. It wasn't until the children approached an old abandoned house did things begin to take a turn. The children knocked and waited, but being an abandoned house, obviously no one answered. So the kids went off and Jim Bates escorted them. Ronald though, for whatever reason, waited. Later on, Ronald caught up with Jim Bates and the children and explained that there were actually people living in the house and that they had given him five large pixie sticks. Thinking nothing of it, each of the children took one. It soon began to rain, and everyone went home. A pretty normal end to a night of trick-or-treating. When they got home, Timothy asked his father Ronald if he could have one sweet before he went to bed. Lo and behold, he picked the pixie sticks, a large 22-inch stick of powdery candy that Ronald had obtained from the abandoned house. After having the sweet, Timothy explained that the sweet tasted bitter and weird. So Ronald, father of the year, in all his wisdom, gave Timothy some Kool-Aid to wash it down. Timothy got into bed and went to sleep, but before long, he was vomiting and convulsing and crying out in pain. He was taken to hospital immediately by ambulance but ultimately died that same night. It was established that Timothy had been poisoned by cyanide that had been peppered into the pixie sticks. According to the pathologist who tested the pixie sticks, there was enough cyanide in the sweet to kill two adults. Many of the other children, including Jim Bates's children, had been given the same pixie sticks and would have suffered the same fate had it not been for quick police intervention. At the time, many were wondering what type of sicko would poison children's candy. At Timothy's funeral, Ronald was said to deliver a tearful and heartfelt speech in honour of his deceased son. Though around the same time, police would learn about Ronald's history of false insurance claims. See where I'm going with this? It turns out that Ronald was in serious debt and had taken out a $20,000 life insurance claim on both of his children. The funeral director for Timothy's service said that O'Brien had requested six separate death certificates just a day after his son's death, and even went on to reveal that his son had been killed by cyanide poisoning days before this had been officially established. Needless to say, the police figured this all out and arrested Ronald for murder. It took a jury even less time to suss him out, and in 45 minutes, they'd found him guilty. It then took a total of 70 minutes to sentence him to death. The Toolbox Killer's Final Kill 
16-year-old Shirley Lynette Ledford made a fatal mistake on Halloween night in 1979 when she trusted the two men who offered her a ride. Two years earlier, in 1977, 29-year-old Roy Norris met 36-year-old Lawrence Bittaker while incarcerated. The two men later dubbed as the Toolbox Killers shared sexually violent fantasies that would lead to a deadly alliance between the two. Upon their release, they planned to rape and murder teenage girls, and together, they purchased a silver GM cargo van nicknamed Murder Mac. They would murder several girls during their sickly shenanigans, and remained on the loose, with Ledford being their final victim. Moments after Ledford climbed inside the van, Bittaker drove to a secluded street, whilst Norris produced a knife. He then bound and gagged Shirley with tape. Bittaker swapped places with Norris, who drove around for over an hour, whilst Bittaker tormented Ledford, ordering her to scream louder as he struck her. It was discovered that the men had actually set up a tape recorder inside the van, and the entire nightmare, including Ledford's cries for help, were all recorded and later produced in court for a full 17 minutes. Bittaker later produced a hammer, which he used to strike Ledford's breasts, as well as savagely destroying her left elbow. He later tortured her with pliers before sodomizing her. In the courtroom, Norris, who was driving for most of the encounter, explained that there was a constant screaming in the back of the van. He later said, We've all heard women scream in horror films. Still, we know that no one is really screaming. Why? Simply because an actress can't produce the same sounds that convince us that something vile and heinous is happening. If you ever heard that tape, there is just no possible way that you'd not begin crying and trembling. I doubt you could even listen to a full 60 seconds of it. Norris was the one to finally kill Ledford by strangling her with a coat hanger. Bittaker then suggested dumping the body on a random lawn to gauge the reaction from the media, to which Norris agreed. They laid the body down on a random lawn, wrenching open the girl's legs, and drove off. Lawrence Bittaker currently remains on death row due to many appeals of the death sentence. Roy Norris, on the other hand, who had cut a deal with the authorities, will have served his 45-year prison sentence next year, in 2019, meaning that a monster like this will soon be eligible for parole. The Murdering Minister John White was set to dream of necrophilia. On a cold Halloween night in 2012, he went to the home of Rebecca Gay, his fiancée's 24-year-old daughter, who was with her three-year-old son. White often looked after Rebecca's son, and it wasn't uncommon for him to visit at her trailer home, so Rebecca was all but happy to let him inside. Mistake. White bludgeons Rebecca repeatedly with a mallet in what would seem like a completely random attack. He wrapped a zip tie around her neck and tightened it until she died. He then stripped her body of her clothes and carried her into the woods. In later questioning, White would go on to say that he couldn't quite remember whether he'd actually had sex with Rebecca's naked corpse, but that he'd thought about it quite intensely prior to the killing. When he returned to the trailer, White calmly dressed Rebecca's three-year-old son in his Halloween costume and drove him to his father's house. The body wasn't found for another day, and while police searched, White had the nerve to ask his congregation to pray for her. White was convicted and later committed suicide in prison. But I suppose some might say that the real horror in all of this is that White had already been convicted twice before for attempted murder. When he was 22, he tried to kill his 17-year-old neighbour, Teresa Efferton, who he'd invited into his basement to look at the model racetrack he'd built. He stabbed her in the back. Then he began kissing her while simultaneously stabbing her. Teresa survived the attack with 15 stab wounds, and White spent two years behind bars. But in 1994, White struck again, and this time, he successfully killed a woman he was having an affair with. He left her body naked in the woods, similar to how he did with Rebecca Gay, but the prosecutors somehow convicted him with manslaughter. Therefore, by 2007, he was free again, 
free again to live his life and free again to become a minister of all things, but more importantly, free to kill again. So that's five horrible stories for you to digest this Halloween. Be sure to stick around this week, as I'll be talking about some more Halloween-esque stories from history. Also, if you're a fan of mythology and fiction, be sure to check out his channel, as he'll be doing a reading of a creepypasta, written by yours truly. Until then guys, hit subscribe, hit like, and share the video. You know the drill. Oh, and also, send me candy. It's Halloween. But candy only. None of this cyanide business. Until the next time, guys.